Well, my name is Tim Marshall. I'm the Provost of the New School and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's very important discussion uh, in celebration of Jeff Smith's book launch. And I'm just going to say some very brief welcoming remarks and then hand, hand proceedings over to Mary Watson. Um, but you probably know, many of you, that the New School's mission is to prepare students to, to understand, contribute to and succeed in a rapidly changing society and thus make the world a much better and just place. Why this particular evening's uh, proceedings are so important to us. The New School uses social engagement to orientate students' academic experience and to help them become critically engaged citizens dedicated to solving problems and contributing to the public good. The Milano School is particularly proud to be taking an active role in achieving these goals by engaging with some of the most distinguished leaders in public policy, advocacy and academia of our age. They have done so by introducing the 2015 Henry Cohen Lecture Series earlier this year and the Policy and Politics Series slated to begin later this month, so please keep your eyes out for, for that, that series. Now, tonight's debate, we have a fantastic panel here to discuss what are very uh, important and difficult issues, and it's, I'm sure, going to spark a much larger debate, both this evening and, uh, and beyond, um, in various forums as we talk about these very uh, complex and serious issues around policy and justice and injustice, race and so on, um, that are really haunting this country, I think, at this point in time. So uh, with that, I just want to say again, thank you for being with us uh, to begin this important dialogue. And I want to, first of all, well, in concluding, congratulate Jeff Smith on the publication of his book. I'm not sure where he is. There he is over there. Congratulations, Jeff. <laughs> and now hand over to Mary Watson, who's the Executive Dean for the New School for Public Engagement, who will actually proceed from here. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to the New School. Um, I'm Mary Watson, Executive Dean of the New School for Public Engagement, and on behalf um, of the entire university community, I welcome you here tonight uh, to join me in celebrating uh, the, the launch of Jeff Smith's book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison. Um, I also want to take a moment to extend a special, special welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. Um, and encourage all of you on live stream to participate in tonight's discussion by submitting your questions in the chat window on the screen. We'll be looking at those as the conversation continues. So um, we're very excited to welcome you here to the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy as part of a series of faculty book launches which will be held this fall. Um, let me start by introducing um, our author tonight, Jeff Smith who is Assistant Professor of Politics and Advocacy at the Milano School, where he teaches and researches about political campaigns, policy advocacy, urban political economies, and the legislative process. Jeff received his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, where he studied American politics and public policy and taught in the political science department. He represented St. Louis City as a member of the Missouri State Senate, where he chaired the Senate Democratic Campaign Committee during the 2008 cycle and passed substantial legislation on education, energy, and economic development. Jeff wrote a book recently, and I was on single, called Ferguson in Black and White, which is an exploration of racial and class divisions in America. He's written countless articles and made many, many television and media appearances um, with his work and other, uh, on other relevant topics. We're here tonight to talk about uh, Jeff's book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison, which is a profound, disturbing, and sometimes funny recollection of Jeff's time in prison. Uh, the book exposes the glaring aspects of the American criminal justice system and shines a light on the race-based relationship with the cycle of poverty in prison that impacts our current generation and future generations. <laughs> Howard Dean said of Jeff's book, Mr. Smith Goes to Prison joins Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow as essential reading on America's greatest failure, our prison system. Anyone who wants to work on fixing the prison system, Howard Dean advised, should start by reading this riveting book. So I welcome and congratulate Jeff on the publication of his book. Jeff has stepped up to the podium. And Next, it's my privilege to introduce Tere, who is here to um, moderate the panel discussion around um, Jeff's book. 
Duray is the author, co-author of the definitive biography of Prince. I think it's not appropriate to say the artist formerly known as Prince anymore, but if I say that, that will everybody will know who I'm talking about. Um, he is also the collaborator on two forthcoming memoirs with Nas and Rakim, so he's been very active in this uh, biography and memoir space. Um, he's former co-host of MSNBC's The Cycle, where he and Jeff actually shared the, uh, the stage and the, uh, the camera spot for a number of events. So welcome you, Trey, to the mic to introduce the panel. Am I here on top of the, yeah, wherever you want. Where, wherever I want, oh, please. Um, thank you all for being here. Let me bring out the rest of our folks who are going to be up here with us before we have a little bit of a... Um, opening remark, um, Sophia Elijah is a longtime civil rights attorney, an extremely powerful woman, and the director of the Correctional Association of New York. Sophia, please come join us. Uh, you can sit next to Jeff. Um, please. Um, Carla Shedd is a professor of sociology at Columbia who will tonight be uh, talking for two. Carla, please join us. And Melissa Mark Viverito is the speaker of the city council. Please come join us. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight on this rainy evening to celebrate the release of Jeff's rather extraordinary uh, book. Congratulations on that, Jeff. Um, there's about 2.2 million people in America's prisons right now. We incarcerate more people than any nation on earth, more than China, more than Iran, all these, this, South Africa, more all these nations that we look down on morally, we incarcerate more people. Um, and prison is criminogenic. Prison creates criminals. Prison makes nonviolent offenders into criminals. Um, we, our prisons have a 65% recidivism rate. As Jeff said to me the other day in an interview, if there was any business in America that failed 65% of the time, its products failed, there would be federal legislation to change that. And yet, two-thirds of our prisoners end up recidivating within five years. That is a complete and utter failure of the system. So how do we do better? That's what we're going to talk about tonight um, with these four extraordinary people. Jeff, you've been there, done that. How do we do prison a little bit better? So I'm going to get up and read a bit from the book and kind okay. of explain. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, distinguished panelists, for, uh, for joining us. I am going to read a few excerpts from the book, uh, and then we'll get started on the panel. The first correctional officer, or CO, that I saw had two teeth, and he was almost impossible for me to understand. Manchester FCI is tucked in a desolate southeastern Kentucky mountain hollow and sits snugly in a crater atop a former coal mine. This CO had apparently not traveled far. He sent me to a heavyset nurse who had a battery of questions for me. Hot and weight, she asked. Five, six, 120. Education level? Uh, PhD. <laughs> she shot me a skeptical look. <laughs> Last profession? State senator. <laughs> she rolled her eyes. If you want to play games, play games. You'll fit right in here. We got ones here that think they're Jesus Christ. <laughs> the CO escorted me to a doorless bathroom. Strip, he commanded. I did. Turn around, he barked. Now let me see your prison wallet. I looked at him quizzically. Open up your butt cheeks. I did. He manhandled me roughly. All right, you's good to go. Six months earlier, with a nervous spring in my step, I'd bounded up to my lawyer's office. My heart pounded, and it hadn't stopped since the feds had dumped on my door at 7 a.m. that morning. The walls were closing in on me, and it all stemmed from my first campaign, long before I was a state senator. Back in 2004, as a political nobody, 
I ran against the scion of Missouri's most beloved political dynasty for a congressional seat <coughs> and came up just short. But the campaign had a dark underbelly that no one else had seen. A few weeks before election day, two of my aides were approached by a shadowy man who wanted to produce a postcard highlighting my leading opponent's poor legislative attendance record in the state house. <coughs> I was pretty sure that campaigns couldn't legally coordinate with any outside party, but I was also pretty sure that it happened every day. After a brief discussion, my aides asked me if they should move forward. Whatever you guys do, I said, just don't tell me any details. Understand? They nodded. They understood. And we agreed not to ever speak of the matter again. The postcard dropped in the campaign's final week. It was totally amateurish. But my opponent filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission alleging that my campaign had illegally coordinated with the postcard's producer. And a few weeks after the campaign, I signed a false affidavit denying any advanced knowledge about it. Five years later, my best friend called me to discuss all of this. He said he wanted to talk in person. He said that the feds had picked up the man who had produced that postcard on an array of other charges, including the car bombing of his ex-wife's divorce lawyer. I had let my aides deal with this monster. And now, what if he were to talk? For weeks, we tried to decide what to do. We went back and forth, and I said that I would have to stick by my original statement from my affidavit five years earlier. Little did I know that that entire time, my best friend was wearing a wire. Soon thereafter, I pleaded guilty to two counts of obstruction of justice for impeding the federal investigation into the, into the postcard. As a senator, I'd pass legislation to reform Missouri criminal statutes without consulting any correctional officers. But once the gates slammed shut in Manchester, Kentucky, the tables were turned. COs had all the power and they exercised it ruthlessly. They, along with my fellow prisoners, were the ones who knew the score. And my education would be rocky. On my first day, I was taken up the yard and I met my celly. He was nicknamed Red because of his resemblance to Morgan Freeman's character in Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> He asked me how long I had. Year and a day, I replied. Well, I've done more time in here on the toilet than you got time, he replied. He'd spent the past 25 years in and out of prison on various charges. It was only then that I realized how lucky I was compared to my fellow prisoners, most of whom had received initial sentences of 10 years or more as part of the misguided mandatory minimum sentencing policy. A week in, a CO awakened me at 6 a.m., called me down to the admin building. I thought it either meant that my request to teach civics in the education department was granted or that I'd received mail requiring my signature. But Red, he caught the spring in my step at 6 a.m. He said they didn't call you down to the admin building at 6 a.m. to sign mail. And they sure as shit didn't do it to tell you that you're going to be teaching a bunch of convicts. I was led into a large barren room. A stocky man with a shaved head and a goatee identified himself as the prison captain in charge of all discipline. Inmate Smith, he sneered. So how long was you in politics? About a decade. Hmm. Well, then you probably know a little bit more about politics than I do, don't you? He paused to savor his plug of tobacco. And how long you been in prison for? Uh, about a week, sir. Well, I've been working in prisons 18 years now. So who you think knows more about prison, me or you? Probably you, I said. Well, yeah, probably so. So I got a little advice for you. You ain't blending so well around here. This uh, rumor that you's writing a book here, it ain't helping. Well, sir, I wanted to try to make the most of my time here. Well, you know it's rules against conducting business out the prison? We think what you're doing might be against the rules. Well, I read the rules, sir. I read the handbook, and it said that no prisoner can operate a business out of his cell. And the way I interpreted that, I'm not conducting a business like selling pornography or tattoos. I wouldn't receive a penny while I'm here. So it doesn't seem like I'm breaking a rule. Ah, oh, I see. Is that how you interpret it, inmate Smith? Because I got some news for you. This ain't no Senate, and this ain't no Supreme Court. And if I think you's conducting a business, you's probably conducting a business. And if you ain't, we'll throw you in the shoe for six months while we figure it out. The shoe was solitary confinement. The next day, I received my work detail for the year, unloading trucks in the prison food warehouse. I think I have a picture up here if the AV guy wants to uh, put up the uh, oh, yeah. picture of, of me mm. working in the, uh, on the loading docks. 
we moved all the incoming food in and out of massive freezers that were about, you can probably see which one I am. Um, <laughs> we moved all the incoming food in and out of freezers that were about as big as this room. I got a close-up look inside the bowels of the prison industrial complex. Most of the meat had expiration dates of 2006 or 2007. Mm. This was 2010. It's not that we thought we deserved filet mignon, but that we were fed such obviously stale and repulsive food reminded us exactly what the system thought of us. We weren't quite animals, but we weren't quite human either. Miss Horton, a gruff chain-smoking CO with spiky gray hair, supervised us. And on my first day, she said that if we didn't steal, she promised to feed us well. My colleagues that day left with a dozen chicken patties saran wrapped around their chest to be sold once we re returned to the yard. Now I'd promised my family that I would not break any rules in prison. But soon another prisoner approached me and said that I'd better start stealing immediately because if I didn't, one of my colleagues was going to plant raw hamburger meat in my coat. Since I wasn't stealing, apparently they feared that I would rat them out. I didn't know whether to trust this new prisoner or not. I thought he might be setting me up, trying to trap me into stealing so he could rat me out. There are four levels of former violations inside prison. They're called shots, and most serious were series one breaches, like murder or inciting a riot. But because of fears about the potential deadliness of E. coli if it's spread around the compound, theft of raw meat could actually be a series one shot, leading to new charges, additional charges, and then a turn in solitary confinement and likely transfer to a high security prison. That scared the shit out of me. Prisoners who describe solitary describe claustrophobia, rage, depression, hallucinations, and self-mutilation. Slow motion torture. Yet now, just two weeks in, the possibility of it became real. So I waited for Miss Horton to take her smoking break, drifted backwards a few steps, dug into a box of green peppers, and frantically stuffed one in each sock and another in each pocket. When we got back to the yard, I emptied my pockets and showed off my take. Damn, said one of my colleagues, the senator's a regular convict now. And there was no higher praise. To anoint someone a convict was the prison equivalent of endowing a professor. What I didn't yet realize was that this episode did more than just temporarily keep me out of trouble. It introduced me to a defining feature of prison life, ingenuity. BJ was one of my fellow prisoners with incredible ingenuity and entrepreneurial drive. His twin obsessions, luxury sports cars and redheads, were abundant in his previous life as a Detroit drug kingpin. But now, BJ had figured out a way to merge his two passions. He vowed that when he got out, he was going to fly straight. He was building a website, or actually his son, 19-year-old uh, son, had, was building a website targeted at men who had a fetish for women having sex on top of luxury sports cars. And for $10,000, he'd purchase the domain, the site design, and all the back-end work enabling financial transactions. Prison was teeming with men like this. Not all of their business ideas were like that, but they all had ideas. They were ambitious, street-smart men who had business instincts not much different than those of the CEOs who had wined and dined me six months earlier as a state senator. Using somewhat different jargon that you might hear at Harvard Business School, they discussed the exact same concepts you would learn there. Promotional incentives, new product launch, quality control, supply chain management, risk management, territorial expansion, and barriers to entry. Ingenuity was a prerequisite for successful hustling. And most of them had a hustle. And the reason why they had a hustle is because unlike the conventional wisdom, prison is not, it's actually expensive. Sophia Elijah knows this very well, and I think, and I know uh, Professor Shedd knows it too. But prisoners don't just get three hots in a cot and their life is made. Prisoners have to buy most everything, including soap, deodorant, shampoo, just the basics of personal hygiene. And they have to do it on pretty low wages. For a 40-hour week in the prison warehouse, I received uh, $5.25. Not an hour, but that was a monthly wage. When your phone calls cost as much as $2 a minute home, it's pretty hard to live on $5.25 a month. The ingenuity that I saw took many forms. Cutting hair with toenail clippers, making weights out of boulders placed in laundry bags tied around a bar. Many prisoners planned to use their ingenuity to start barbershops, restaurants, personal training businesses when they got out. 
but they received no preparation to make these ideas a reality. No one to help them write business plans or translate their intuitive grasp of the business world into legal industries. Not even an internet connection to help them learn more or start looking for a job. And there was no staff interest at all in rehabilitation. <coughs> You'll be back, shitbird, said one CO to prisoners as they were on their way out. Upon release, 650,000 men show up on the doorsteps of America's communities every year trying to succeed in the same neighborhoods where they once failed. Only now they have the added stigma of prison records. Two-thirds of them will reoffend within three years, and the main reason is financial struggle. Most are unemployed, and they're far more likely to commit a crime when they're unemployed than people with jobs. And seeking legitimate work can seem almost laughable when nine out of every 10 employers conduct criminal background checks, and most of them refuse to hire anyone with a record. Prison education programs can help overcome this. The natural ingenuity of prisoners makes entrepreneurship education particularly ideal. But only when society stops seeing prison as a warehouse for society's throwaways and starts seeing it as a costly waste of human potential will the status quo ever change. Prisoners, I'm going to read about two more short excerpts if you don't mind. Prisoners frequently alluded to the money made by private companies, construction firms, and the vendors whose truck rattled up and down the road to Manchester. All commissary items were marked up 40 to 50 percent despite being of low quality. When I was young, my family used to joke that, that I thought my last name was irregular because it was stamped in the back of all my clothes. <laughs> but those same types of labels, but far worse, were affixed to all the food that came into the warehouse. The most common one was for institutional use only, reminding us that we were not getting the choicest cuts of, of meat. One CEO told us we were really lucky that a few years before, all the fish that came in was labeled not for human consumption. Some members of the prison staff, of course, were also in on the hustle, making money, taking home entire boxes of food for themselves and winking at us while they did so. What are you looking at, thundered one CO the day that I saw him putting a whole crate of Hostess cupcakes into his trunk. Moments like these added to our sense that we were just pawns in a larger game of prison profiteering. And phone calls reminded us of the most egregious aspect of profiteering. That moment in the middle of your call when you're trying to have some intimacy with a loved one and the voice comes in, you have a call, you are on a call from Manchester Federal Correctional Institution. Do you choose to continue accepting this call? A recent study of phone rates showed, as I said, that they run as high as $2 a minute and not even including many undisclosed charges. Companies make billions exploiting the families of incarcerated people by offering substantial kickbacks to the prisons they serve because the commission that they give the prison is based on the percentage of revenue generated by prisoners' calls. While privatization advocates claim that outsourcing like this actually is cost-cutting, it actually just diverts a ton of costs away from the government and onto inmates and their families who can least afford it even as windflow profits flow to the firms involved. This encourages legislators to support policies like mandatory minimum sentences that not only exacerbate mass incarceration, but provide shoddy service and expensive service to inmates. After all, neither prisoners nor most parolees can vote, and their families tend to be politically feeble. Nobody's ever lost an election by being too hard on prisoners. Exacerbating this political weakness of minority offenders in particular is the fact that most urban offenders are removed from their voting district and transferred to other voting districts in rural areas, usually, where their bodies are counted while states apportion legislative representation despite their inability to actually vote. It's sort of like a modern-day three-fifths compromise. The only difference is that the offenders are five-fifths of a person when it comes to determining representation and zero-fifths of a person when it comes to actually voting. And many states even disenfranchise parolees and probationers, sometimes even for life, further impairing ex-prisoners' ability to affect policy change. The denial of regular contact between 2.7 million children and their incarcerated parents, especially through these expensive phone calls, increases the likelihood of both use dysfunction and adult recidivism. And that's a great example of the type of policies that could be changed if all ex-offenders could vote. 
Academic studies show that prisoners who maintain healthy relationships with their family members are much more likely to obtain employment and much less likely to recidivate. Increasing the expense of these phone calls and thereby decreasing its likelihood and frequency is not only callous and ultimately detrimental to public safety, uh, given the expected increase in recidivism, um, it's just downright cruel. I saw the pain and frustration of so many men who kept making phone calls to loved ones and seeing them be cut off after only one or two minutes because they couldn't afford any more. And thus, not only does the transfer of urban minority offenders to rural counties provide immediate political benefits for rural legislators, but it increases the likelihood of recidivism by making it harder for prisoners to stay connected. Indeed, upon closer inspection, one might say that mass incarceration isn't the product of a system that's broken, but rather the result of a well-oiled machine that keeps millions of people outside of our economic mainstream. I spent less than a year in prison. I had every possible advantage upon reentry. I wasn't disabled in prison. I didn't sustain permanent physical damage or permanent psychological damage from violence or sexual assault. I was a white guy with a PhD from one of the best universities in this country. I had community support, I had family support, I had 300 people, including the Lieutenant Governor, the Attorney General, the State Auditor, the Mayor of St. Louis, writing letters to the judge asking for clemency. And I had financial savings. Yet even for me, getting a decent job when I came out of prison was a struggle. Imagine how hard it is for the guys that I was locked up with and most people in prison in this country. Most had a GED, if that, that they earned in prison. Some hadn't had a visit from anyone in a decade. They had no one to call on the phone. They had no savings to fall back on. And they were going to be coming back into a world in which four out of five landlords would do a background check and not rent to them if they had a record, and nine out of 10 employers wouldn't hire them. This is a world in which most of them are not allowed to vote, and drug offenders can't use food stamps for the rest of their life even though they must immediately find money to pay for halfway house rooms and urinalysis tests, and they can't even afford clothes for a job interview. In light of all this, it's not surprising that two out of three people released from prison reoffend. And in fact, it's surprising to me that only two out of three people reoffend, given all these obstacles. Only a complete transformation in our cultural mindset, a realization that people who are incarcerated could, to paraphrase President Obama, during his recent prison visit, be our brothers, be our sons, be our daughters, be ourselves. Only that type of transformation will change that. Thank you very much. And now back to my good friend, Ture, to uh, lead the panel. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. That was amazing. Um, the book is extraordinary, so if you haven't already read it, I would highly recommend it. And I want to spend most of our time um, on prison reform and what we're doing wrong in terms of prison, but you got so personal there, Jeff, that I want you to talk a little bit about your personal experience and how did you, f I mean, this picture as a backdrop, how did you physically survive this experience, and how did you psychologically survive this experience? Um, so physically, Ture, uh, when I came in, so I came in about 120, and the boxes uh, of meat, most of them are 80 pounds, and the bags of rice and beans and flour and sugar are 100 pounds, and when you're working on a loading dock, as any of you who've done it know, you stand in a line, so there's like eight of you in a line, and you just throw the bags or boxes from one person to another. So catching the 100-pound bags of sugar and, and rice, uh, that, um, that gave my colleagues a good laugh for my first month or so. Uh, but I spent, I'd come home, we'd move about 40,000 pounds. It wasn't that prisoners ate that much food. It was that the food from four or five years ago was in the freezer and we would have to bring that food to the front of the freezer, bring the new food to the very back of the freezer. Remember I told you the freezers are like this big. So we have to move like a lot more food than you actually get in because you have to move the food out, move the new food to the back and then restack the food that you moved out. So you kind of have to move it each three times. So I had to get bigger 
And so when I came home from that job every day, I lifted weights uh, and I had to get bigger in order to play basketball because um, that was the only thing. But the gap, Jeff, is gigantic. <laughs> You're going to make it up by lifting. That's my last week. So that's, that's, thir that's with 30 pounds of muscle from, from coming in. So you should have seen me when I first got there relative to those guys. Um, but I, I, I will say that uh, I knew I also had to get bigger to play basketball because basketball in prison is actually like um, what we know on the outside as football. And uh, you, you know, there's just no way that I could go to the basket you know, and at all, or even <laughs> step into the paint in the condition that I was in when I got there. So, um, but I knew I had to play basketball because frankly, playing basketball was the only time that I forgot where I was. And so uh, prisoners are, are told not to, not to play in their final year. They don't play in their final year because if you're short, which means if you're about to, to hit the door, you're a target. The legend in prison, I don't know if this is true or not, is that if you're hurt, they won't let you go home. People say that, everyone says that they've seen people who are hurt and they won't let them go home because it's not good PR for the prison system, right, to have people coming out damaged. And so no one will play anything during their last year because they don't want their out date delayed. And, uh, uh, but I, I just, you know, I was so much sure, you, for them, as you could tell from my Sully's comment when I got in, I just had this little bit of time. They couldn't understand why I would play anything. You know, many of them had 17-year sentences, uh, you know, because they had 10 years for the mandatory minimum uh, on the amount of crack cocaine they had. They had five years because they had a gun for protection somewhere in their house or their car. And then a lot of them had a sentencing enhancement because they were within, like, you know, a half mile of a school or a park or, you know, some other place, and these enhancements just got piled on. So to them, um, yeah, they, they thought it was, it was silly that I'd, that I'd play anything. But uh, psychologically, you asked, the way I survived was by, uh, number one, just incredible wisdom from the guys that I did time with who had so much more time than me and gave me lessons in how to do the time. And number two, just the people on the outside that stuck with me. Uh, it wasn't much time, like I said, compared to what others have, but I would just, before we go any further, encourage anybody who has a loved one, a friend uh, who is incarcerated, or even if you don't, get a pen pal, you know, or go visit someone because that sustained me during my time. You know, people definitely need people to do that time with them, and it's a serious commitment. Um, ladies, we will get all of you in talking a lot. Jeff is talking a lot. I just want to set him up as the author, and it's his home turf. Um, Jeff, let's get more analytical, the question from before, how can prison be done better? What do you say to that? There's a lot of ways it can be done better. The first way is to provide educational programming inside of prisons and vocational training. The whole year, you know, the almost year that I was there, they had like a GED course, and which they didn't monitor at all, and then a hydroponics course for two weeks, so it showed prisoners how to grow tomatoes in water. Well, that's great, you know, you'll do that on the outside and you're, you're set for life, right? If you can grow tomatoes, I mean, ridiculous. So what they need to be doing is trying to align prisoners' assets and their aptitudes with the employment needs in the communities to which they'll return, whether it's welding or electrical wiring or fixing computers or home health care, you know, training, you know, I, I think we should try to treat prison almost as vocational school where, you know, the difference is you can't go home at night but at least we should try to give people some skill where they can come out. Uh, and I know it will be politically difficult to spend money on people who have committed crimes when there's people who haven't committed crimes who wish they had funding for vocational training. But the fact is it's the best investment we can make because a dollar of spending on prison education, according to RAND, which did a comprehensive study of this, returns six dollars in benefits to society through reduced recidivism. So that's the most important thing we can do to change prison. Sophia, Elijah, same question to you. How can we make prison more effective for society? Well, the first thing I would say is we need to overhaul our attitude about the people who are in prison. So we should stop uh, dehumanizing and objectifying people and recognize them as people. So if we started treating everybody who's inside like a person, like we would want to be treated, then we would eliminate all of the dehumanizing um, 
treatment and activities and abuses that people are subjected to. I think we should all remember that when a judge sentences someone to prison, the, the punishment that they've um, inflicted is, or imposed is to take away your liberty, which is something that we say we hold very dear. So if that is the punishment, no judge sentences you to having your limbs broken, beaten, being beaten up, being um, spoken to disrespectfully, um, being separated from your family indefinitely, and having your family mistreated. So we need to change. We need to stop being hypocritical about what it is that we supposedly believe we use prisons for. So we need to start there. If we start from that premise, then the things that Jeff suggested would be very easy. And we would say, that's the most important thing for us to do with our money. Why would we use our money to dehumanize people that we think are then going to reintegrate into society successfully? Professor, same question to you. <laughs> well, I know um, as a sociologist who studies individuals and marginalized groups and their interaction with formal institutions, I'm more interested in how we could do a better job of keeping people out of the prison. I get how can we do prison better. But to do prison inside means we have to acknowledge that we're not um, to do education inside the prisons means we have to acknowledge that we're not doing a great job of educating people before they do something that might lead them um, to be incarcerated. So the kids I studied in Chicago for my first book, they're you know, most likely to drop out between ninth and 10th grade. We know that educational failure is one of the biggest reasons why we have this huge swell in our prison populations. So this is really, really post hoc, but if we're thinking about what prisons can do as public institutions, they should serve these fundamental needs. They should be a resource, but we have to think about the failure of the other formative institutions like our schools and our neighborhoods um, that people are now navigating that are leading them directly to the criminal justice system. Madam Speaker, there was a rather extraordinary story came out of New York City a couple months ago about Khalif Browder, who seemed to have been let down at every turn, uh, picked up on a very small, relatively small offense um, that ended up to not be true. Uh, couldn't afford a, what most people would consider a very low amount of bail. Uh, goes to court, was it 60, 70 times over, what was it, three like years. three years? It, and each time he's going to court, I know you know the story, I don't know if everybody here knows the story, each time he goes to court, it's, it's dismissed, it's, con it's, it's not dismissed, it's continued for some reason because the prosecutor is on vacation, because the judge is not ready, because his attorney is not ready, it's, and then he comes home and kills himself because of the trauma that he experienced uh, in prison. Uh, how can New York prisons be better for the folks who are being brought into them? Well, I think, I mean, you know, I don't profess to be uh, the expert that everyone on this panel is, right? Coming from the perspective of being a legislator and, and someone who has to look at policies and laws that exist, you know, I think I, I very much agree with what the uh, professor said about, you know, how do we prevent people having to even have that initial in negative interaction uh, with the criminal justice system. The, the need for reform clearly is urgent, uh, and there's many different layers to it. You know, we in the city council are aggressively engaged in a, uh, oversight conversations with this administration about what is happening at Rikers Island, right? And the serious need for deep reform. Yes, there are those that are calling for shutting it down, et cetera. Those are conversations that we're engaged in, but the need um, for serious reform that, that is at different levels, whether it's the, you know, the corrections officers and the way they're interacting with um, uh, those imprisoned. But you know, we're looking at different things that will try to prevent that initial interaction. And, and there's a lot of criticism that I receive for that, right? Because uh, people think that we're taking the city back you know, to the 70s and that we're contributing to the increase in crime, et cetera. But the need for re-looking re at how we interact or how we deal with mi uh, minor nonviolent offenses and whether or not people even get arrested for those, right? We're having a conversation about trying to revisit how some of those low-level nonviolent offenses are being looked at so that we can try to prevent any sort of interaction um, 
with the criminal justice system unnecessarily, looking at bail reform, for instance, and creating a bail fund here in the city of New York, because we know, unfortunately, that if you are poor, you know, uh, we, we um, they're gonna be, you know, if you and I are accused of the same low-level nonviolent offense, and the bail could be as low as $200 or $500. Uh, if I have the ability to pay it, I get released, right, with a court date having to come back. If someone is poor and can't pay those $200, that person could potentially be sitting at Rikers for up to 10 days. And that person could lose their job, they could lose custody of their children, the societal implications are, uh, you know, are, are big, and things that we should be concerned about. So we're looking at that as well. So we, in the school, you know, to, to prison pipeline that exists, we've passed legislation in the city of New York to take a look more aggressively at that. So there's things that we're trying to do from a legislative and public policy perspective to try to minimize that initial interaction. Uh, and then in Rikers itself, there's a lot of overhauling that has to happen seriously and aggressively. We're hearing the horror stories every day, um, and there is an acknowledgement that there is a serious problem there. So uh, I didn't want to go on, but you yeah. know, there's, it's very uh, complicated. You referenced an attitude that we hear a lot. You know, when you said, you know, people say, "Oh, we're you know we're going back to the '70s," and for some reason, I think most Americans are unaware that we are in the midst of a massive historic crime drop. Mm -hmm. Do people know that, that, that New York City in particular, just like all the big cities in America, um, we see this coast to coast, uh, New York City is at crime levels that are akin to what we saw in the 60s, in the early 60s, right? The national homicide rate is at like a century low, back to when we were mainly an agrarian society. But most people don't seem to know that media doesn't talk about it because media has a bad news bias. If crime was horrible, then they would report that. But to say crime is actually going in the right direction, why would anybody say that, right? Um, so, you know, these attitudes that lead to let's stay hard, let's get hard on criminals, the attitudes are still there without the actual information that, uh, you know, we don't need that tough on crime approach. That We're not in the, in the mid to late 80s and the early 90s when things were horrible. We've seen crime go straight down, even in Chicago, which has half the number of annual murders that it did 20 years ago. But people say Chicago and you think, bam, wild west of crime. Um, Sophia, let's keep this hyper-local for a moment. What do you think about the idea of closing Rikers? That's a good start. <laughs> it's a good place to start. Um, you know, at the, the Correctional Association of New York, we monitor the conditions in the, in the state prisons, and we're calling for the closure of Attica. The same atrocities that happen at Rikers Island happen at Attica. The, Difference is because it's Rikers Island, it's closer to the city, so people have more access, so they are more likely to know what's going on, as opposed to these prisons that are in these rural upstate areas, like close to Canada, where, I don't know about you, but I'm not going close to the border of Canada in winter if I can help it. But <laughs> that's where the kinds of atrocities where people are being beaten and abused and, um, and killed as we saw at the Fishkill facility and also at the Sullivan facility. So we uh, need to, to close Rikers and we need to take a hard look at what we as a society think is acceptable as far as how people are treated. The people are not supposed to be abused just because they've been sent to prison. Mm -hmm. When you say close Rikers or I mean, close, close Attica, yeah, close. Do, you, do you mean um, close. Send all those, like end the facility and send all those folks home or transfer them to facilities where they can be treated more humanely? I think there's a few things that we can do. And I've made these suggestions to the commissioner, and I'm sure that he would acknowledge that I've made these suggestions. So one of the things that I think we could do, particularly let's start with our maximum security facilities. And this goes back to the point that you were making about um, the fact that somebody's misbelieving that crime rates have not gone down. Well, we know the crime rates have gone down. So if crime rates have gone down, we would need arguably fewer police and fewer prison guards. But that would mean fewer jobs for those people. So they have to keep driving a narrative that says that crime hasn't gone down. Okay, so that's, that's one of the first things. So now if we look at our maximum security facilities, those are the most expensive ones to operate because of the ratio of prison guards to people who are incarcerated. And you'll notice I don't use the word inmate or prisoner because it objectifies people. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm educating everybody. On so you prefer what language? People. 
people who are incarcerated. People who are incarcerated, people who aren't incarcerated. But we could look at the security level that has been assigned to people when they come into the system. So when people are first brought into the system, a security level is assigned to them primarily based on the severity of the offense for which they've been convicted and also looking at their, their criminal history. So for people who've been in the system for a long time, what we should be doing is reevaluating their security level, level periodically because what we should be hoping is that they have transformed while they are inside and that their risk to public safety has gone down. So we have a lot of people who are serving time in maximum security facilities who've been there for a long period of time because of something that they may have done 10 and 20 years ago and their security level could be brought down and they could be put in a medium or a minimum security facility which are far less expensive to operate. And people who are in medium and minimum security facilities, we could reevaluate their security levels also, and perhaps they could be maintained in the community, which is a whole lot cheaper. It's $60,000 a year to incarcerate someone in New York State on average, and about eleven dollars to $12,000 a year to maintain them in the community. We don't even need a calculator. Professor, you know, we, we talk about using language like people who are incarcerated. Uh, it seems so easy for most of us who are on the outside, never been to prison, to just sort of blanket, just sort of, you know, they're all stupid. I mean, actually, at my former job, where you would think everyone is progressive and thoughtful, somebody just outwardly said in a meeting, criminals are stupid, meaning inmates are stupid, right? And I was like, that's clearly not true. And fortunately, a couple of other, you know, but I didn't want to be the one, all oh, the black guys standing up for the black inmates again. Mm -hmm. But um, a couple of the people said, no, that can't be true. And surely the amount of smart to dumb people is probably equal to what we have in regular society. But how do we get people out here to see people who are incarcerated in a more humane way when it's so easy to demonize them? Well, actually, um, this othering or social distance has been decreased because of the numbers of people who are ensnared in the justice system. Mm -hmm. So you have these questions about representation, who is in there. Look at Jeff. He doesn't look like, you know, what we might think a person in a, right. a correctional facility would look like. Um, there are also questions about who can tell these stories. Who will people listen to? Perhaps because Jeff wrote this book and put his very photogenic face on this cover, more people will listen to this because they don't see him as criminal. As sociologists, we know all of this is very much a product of socialization. Who do we see as criminal? Who do we interpret as dangerous? How do we understand people's motivations and aspirations based on what they look like, where they're from, what they're wearing, how they, you know, talk to me? Do they smile? So all of these other things that might, um, widen the gap between understanding one person's plight from yours have now been lessened because we have expanded the you know reach of this system in so many ways and i think for the question about you know closing facilities the juvenile justice system in new york city is a great example where you've seen the closing of these upstate facilities where they were sending children as i'm calling them in my research from the juvenile courts here these are children of the era of mass incarceration. These are children of the, ch of the prison boom, as um, Chris Wilderman and Sarah Wakefield will say in their book. And so what is it about being desensitized into these institu institu institutions, moving from poor schools and poor neighborhoods, going to um, you know, the family court system and oversight through you know, all of these means of adjusting to institutionalization into systems. And so if we close those facilities, we realize we have to do more on the community front. And we've seen that. Um, sometimes there's, you know, an issue where the judge says, you went AWOL from my facility because you know where you are. So we've seen some of those problems, but we're bringing the problem back home and having to deal with it on the home front. So I think the, you know, closing the distance and, and decreasing the social gap will help us a bit in trying to reduce the othering. Jeff, we're at a unique uh, moment in American political history that suddenly the, the tide is turning. I think 
uh, President Clinton, when he was Governor Clinton, realized and showed that you have to be tough on crime in order to win big elections, right? And so, so he moved the Democrats to the right on this issue, right? And we've just in kind of a repugnant way. Yeah. Actually, though, I mean, you know, he yeah. he he wanted so desperately to prove during the. Uh, primary campaign in 1992 that that he would eliminate the Democratic Party's image as being soft on crime, that he flew all the way home from New Hampshire in the run-up to the primary to preside over the execution of a man who was so deficient, um, so disabled, that he, uh, he was at his final meal and he asked, he insisted that they set aside Save his some. pecan pie for later. Yeah, His name was Billy Ray Rector. And, uh, and then, of course, when he got into office, w one of the first things that he pushed was the 1994 crime bill, which expanded the use of the death penalty, expanded mandatory minimums, um, and Hillary Clinton was someone who pushed for the three strikes law. So I'm sorry to interrupt your question. No, 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 that's important. I mean, so now we're at a different place where we have folks on the right, not just Rand Paul, but also governors saying, you know, we should go in a different direction. They may not be talking in a humane uh, point of view, they may be talking from a more, more economic point of view, but they are on the page of saying, perhaps we should do this differently. So talk a little bit about why that political wind has changed and what you think could come of it. That's a great question, Trey. Um, so I think the wind has changed in large part because each of the sort of disparate coalition components of the modern day Republican Party has a pretty good reason to support prison reform. Um, Christian conservatives make up a big wing of the party, and starting in the you know in the late 70s and early 80s, led by a guy named Ch Chuck Colson, you know who worked for Nixon, um, who started a when he came out of prison started a not a foundation um, to try to help uh, get Christian conservatives inside of prisons to help redeem people's souls, uh, and that has grown in force um, through evangelical churches over the last several years. Then you have libertarian conservatives like the Rand Paul wing of the party, and they don't want government you know, in everybody's like bedroom seeing if they're smoking a bowl. You know? So they're fighting for drug decriminalization, for the reduction of, uh, for the elimination of mandatory minimums, and just the general reduction of, of sentences, but in particular for nonviolent offenders. And then you have the third you know, big wing of the party, which is like fiscal conservatives. And led by a lot of fiscally conservative Republican governors, you know, people like Rick Perry in Texas, like Nathan Deal in Georgia, Nikki Haley in South Carolina. They have said, we cannot afford to keep spending billions of dollars on this revolving door. So the first thing we're going to do is, is more appropriately sentence people on the front end. Uh, and secondly, we're going to try to reduce our recidivism rate. You know, Texas, Texas's recidivism rate is less than half of the national one. Wow. Um, because they've wisely looked for, you know, at Innovative Programs is a program that uh, I'm on, I'm full disclosure, on the board of called the Prison Entrepreneurship <laughs> Program. And See, but, say the, say this is <laughs> but I'm like, they kill most of the people too. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's, the, there's that piece. So high. There's, that, uh, <laughs> very there's effective. no you're one not to come back. You're not going to if yeah. you're dead. <laughs> oh my God. A, a brutally effective means of recidivism reduction. Uh, but Jeff, uh, Melissa, I want to come to you in a second on, the, on a similar point, but Jeff, you're outlining um, why there have been changes on the right, but there are also changes on the left. Democrats finding some spine to stand up for being smart on crime, right? I mean, we see the president going mm -hmm. to prison. And so why is it that Democrats are now coming around to saying, we can actually say out loud what we think? Well, I don't know we're totally there. Because <laughs> um, I think that it still continues to be a hard conversation to engage in. You know, with this conversation, as I mentioned before, that we're engaging in with the administration and this police commissioner on um, these low-level nonviolent offenses uh, does produce a backlash. And sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to engage in it fully. You know, it's, it's, it's just really, I don't know if we can really progress on any of these conversations unless we really do acknowledge that discrimination exists, racism exists, prejudice exists, and that all of that permeates our institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we, until we really chip away and break it down, uh, that we're not gonna be able to make progress on these issues. And I think the constant conversation, that conversation has to be constantly present 
and the movement building that's happening right now is helping, right? Really keep that very much in our face. And I think that we have to be more honest about engaging in that in a public way and acknowledging that those that you know that exists within our institution. So, you know, I it's it's very disheartening, obviously, and it it's very frustrating to know that we are in the way we're running our institutions and the way that our policies are being implemented right now, we are complicit, right, in creating broken individuals. And um, that when we write off any segment of our society, and particularly individuals that are incarcerated, we're writing off the communities they come from. And we know that's even more per, you know, uh, pernicious because it's primarily low-income, poor people of color. Yes. Uh, and so then, you know, so it really is, I think uh, we have to have that, that reality check where we have to keep acknowledging that that's the case. You know, we have segregation in our public school system here in New York City. Yeah. Oh, you know, the largest income gap is here in New York City. Um, you know, these are realities that uh, are very much need to be in our face and that we are trying to, in partnership with this mayor, and really, really trying to um, turn that around. and. The Department of Corrections and the way that we deal with um, with individuals that are incarcerated and um, is, is one way of, of getting at that, and it's uh, it's something that I think is being attempted to be done. Punitive segregation has been minimized; it's not it, it's not completely gone at Rikers, but this this corrections um, commissioner has seriously reduced the use of punitive segregation. Uh, in the city of New York, we did pass a ban the box legislation. Right, um, we're trying to to do different things that, that to hopefully all collectively, you know, we'll start seeing an impact and head in a in a positive direction. Then we can serve as a model, right? That's what we want to do in New York City is that we want to lead the way, uh, in in the way the conversation is going. And so that's why you know some of us are very committed on the ground and you know nose to the grindstone on on getting this done. That's great work, Jeff. You know, this Democratic primary has been. Uh, sort of extraordinary in that Black Lives Matter is the special interest group that is driving the conversation more than any other. Is this current Democratic Party built to continue following this trend that we're talking about with Democrats being able to say, hey, you know, maybe we should be smart rather than tough on crime? I, I feel like Hillary Clinton made a choice several months ago um, that, you know, this is, you know, for better or for worse, I don't know if this is w what she wanted, but this is the old Barack Obama's Democratic Party now. And the coalition that he was able to assemble to win, you know, two times in a row uh, is the Democratic Party coalition now. And it's, it's she thinks it's going to be harder. Her campaign has calculated that it would be more difficult to get white voters in Kentucky to come back to the Democratic Party than it will be to increase turnout and continue energizing our base. And because of that calculation, I think that the Democratic Party uh, is not going to be the party of in the 80s when Congressman Rangel and then Congressman Schumer were like pounding the table for tougher and tougher sentencing. Mm. I think it's going to be increasingly the party of the Black Lives Matter movement that's, uh, that has common sense about these issues. So um, I want to I want to I want to run through a very difficult subject with you guys, uh, and then start taking questions from you guys. So uh, if you haven't filled out your card yet, uh, do that, and we'll get into some of your questions. But I, I do want to deal with a rather difficult um, issue, and hopefully we can do it without language that is. Uh, disturbing to folks, but it is a disturbing issue, and we know that um, rape happens in our prisons. One is too many, but we have far too many. Um, and you know, as you and I spoke about, it, Jeff, it is a massive part of why prison is so criminogenic, why it is so effective at breaking down people and ruining their potential. Um, Sophia, let's just start with you. Can you talk about the impact of rape and the possibility of eliminating or seriously minimizing the amount of rape uh, in our prisons? Certainly. First of all, um, the problem becomes so pervasive that on a federal level, a law was passed called the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which is, is geared to do exactly what it's named for. <laughs> 
But we're going to continue to have a problem of rape in prisons as long as we create these unnatural situations. We have a situation where we take human beings who are sexual. I mean, they, I don't think anybody's debating that. However you play out your sexuality, human beings are sexual. And we're saying we want you to live in an unnatural environment with, with not acknowledging your sexuality for years and years on end. Well, that's just not going to happen. It, that's, that's an unrealistic human experience and experiment. And so people are going to play out their human sexuality in one way or another. And the more likely it seems that they're going to be able to have a normal sexual interaction, when I say normal, consensual, nonviolent, et cetera, the more likely it is that someone's going to engage in rape. I mean, I, I think that that's the, the natural calculation that we can expect that's going to happen. So we limit the opportunity to have what they call family reunification visits, which some inside they call them trailer visits, some people call them conjugal visits. It means basically that your, love, your dear beloved loved one can come spend the weekend with you or a certain number of hours, 36 hours in a trailer and you can have sex. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Okay? But that's not available for the LGBTQ community okay, at all, so that's also a problem. But why would we not allow people to have sexual relations in a, on a weekend or however you want, it could be all week long, in, in a facility. Why not? I mean, what's, what is the reason that we would deny people to have sexual interactions? If, we, if people could have sexual interactions with their loved ones from the outside, then there wouldn't be this, this, this drive to, to um, engage in violent acts of sex inside. Well, let me, you know, Professor, you know, when we talk about um, the crisis, the rape crisis on campus, um, we talk about it's not about sex, it's about power. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand the idea of conjugal visits lessening some of that, but surely prison interactions are constantly about power and status, and there's no greater way of proving that you are dominant over another man than raping him, and then he can't do anything about it. Um, talk a little bit about this problem within this whole economy? I mean, I think um, we're talking about institutions and how do they operate and how do people navigate them. And, you know, Columbia is a frontier for thinking about what's happening. Columbia University, um, where I'm a professor in sociology, is really trying to clean up their act and how do we protect people, how do we acknowledge sexuality, but how do we think about it happening, you know, on our grounds. And I think we could just look at other institutions like prisons where you could try to figure out these same guidelines. I mean, it's not that different if we imagine a kind of structural circumstances beyond lack of liberty or freedom, but we still have human dignity, we still have power, we still have all of these relationships um, that we would have to work out. So, I mean, there are multiple fronts that we're fighting um, in trying to better these, these institutions. I mean, Jeff, you, it is your belief that the rape is wanted by the folks who are running the institutions as it helps to uh, make them even worse. I, I think I would use the word tolerated. Okay. And, and I think it's tolerated by a lot of people because in their minds, prison, has, prison rape has a deterrent effect in, in the street. And I think if we're honest about it, uh, you know, because I've had a lot of conversations in the years since I've come out. If I ask people, other guys on the street, what's your biggest fear? What would you say? Going to prison and getting raped. And sadly, it's tolerated by a lot of authorities because they understand that because that's everyone's worst nightmare, it'll keep some people in line that otherwise would commit crimes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have willing, so willingly sacrificed people's <coughs> physical and psychological health because of a mistake they made for the rest of their life, because that trauma not only affects them, but it affects society. Mm -hmm. They're so much more likely to come out of prison and try to reclaim their manhood in the same violent way that they perceive it to have been taken from them. So it has really profound and far-reaching implications, this, this tolerance. Now, I want to get you guys involved, and I know I saw cards being passed out, and I saw people taking notes. Um, 
but I don't see who is going to help me collect, <laughs> collect the cards. And Oh, you will. Okay, great. So can we grab a couple? Yeah, let's grab a couple of cards and, um, and get you guys involved. You, you know, while we, while we organize this uh, part of it, Professor, one of the things that I learned about, uh, about the prison situation out of the Sandra Bland situation was that suicide is more common in jail than in prison. And for everybody who doesn't fully understand, these are colloquially, these terms are interchangeable, but in reality, they are completely different. That jail is somewhere you go only for a very brief period of time before you are assigned to a prison where you would spend a longer period of time. So the situation where uh, when somebody is taken to jail for a couple of days, they are more likely to commit suicide than in prison. Um, can you speak a little bit about why that would be? I mean, that's a shock to people's systems. And you already have perhaps vulnerable people with the you know, rise in mental illnesses and the deinstitutionalization of mental health facilities and lack of resources. So we have people coming into a net that are already so vulnerable. And if they are in jail, that worsens it. I mean, all these things that are described in this book and from what we may know, um, for those of us who study these systems, it does not help. People are not getting medication, they're not getting therapy, they're not getting resources. And on the other hand, this might be, prison might be the only place where they might get those things, but for jail to be short term and to really disrupt um, people's systems. And, you know, Sandra Bland, and there was just, you know, footage that came out about Natasha McKenna's um, death in a facility. I mean, and I can't watch these videos. It's traumatic. But to think about the people who go through it and their families and them seeing it, um, you see these deficits in so many of our public services and public institutions that are exacerbated when more vulnerable, the most vulnerable people vulnerable people, particularly um, transgender folks, LGBTQ. I mean, we're going to the margins of those who are the most marginalized. And this institution is not set up for them to do well. Um, the first card, Jeff, is a question for you. When does the paperback come out so we can mail it to our friends inside? Isn't that sad? Yeah. Isn't that sad that, that most prisons won't allow hardcover books because mm -hmm. of the uh, it's, it's not as if we couldn't figure out if there's something in the binding, uh, right. some contraband in the binding, but uh, m many prisons um, will not allow hardcover books. I, you know, I hope that there is a paperback is the only answer I can Oh, have. there will be. Stop. My, my editor is right there. Uh, so. Yeah, we got a promise. All right. Absolutely. There we go. Can we, can we get a release date from you? <laughs> not today. You got to talk to your boss. I understand. It's not a promise. It's either. all right. But, no, you know, Jeff, one... They can't get yes. a paper... You can't mail a, a book, a, even a paperback, to someone in New York prisons. It has to come from the publisher. So you got to mm. get the publisher to send a book inside. Wow. And, yeah. I mean, you know, just the fact of this, but just the fact of this book is really important because in my personal experience, a lot of times, thank you, uh, in uh, people who were incarcerated will not talk about what happened. It be, this sort of veil drops and they're like, you know, it's not to be discussed. And I think sort of colloquially in the neighborhood, you know, like you don't ask somebody like, yo, what was it like inside? And um, you know, so you just talking about this is powerful and revolutionary. Well, I, I hope in the same way that it led to great progress for the LGBTQ movement to have more people come out, you know, and, and have pride mm -hmm. in it. Um, I don't have pride in having committed a crime, um, but I am, uh, I understood pretty quickly that I because of this little thing called Google, I didn't have a choice relative to a lot of people who come out. Um, when I put together my cover letter for the new school a few weeks after I came out of prison, the first line I think was, last week I stepped out of federal prison because I knew they'd get hundreds of cover letters and I wanted it to like at least stick that out. That stands out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, you know, I, the last thing you, know, you want is to, is to have people think that you're hiding something. And I knew they would find out eventually, and so I figured it was best to lead with it. Um, a lot of people have a different, you know, have the option of, of trying to conceal it because there aren't a lot of uh, articles about, about their crime. But the fact is, there's tens of millions of people in this country that have felony convictions in their background. And we, even if you don't think you know somebody, I bet you do. 
Um, that's fair. Uh, you know, Sophia, question from the audience. Did the prison boom actually help lower crime? The quintupling of our prison population? I don't think so at all. And if you look at New York State, it's a perfect example. The crime rate in New York State has gone down by 40%. And at the same time, the, the prison population decreased by about 15,000 in t a 10 year period. So that proves that we don't need to lock up lots of people to bring our crime rates down. I mean, I think there's a, a, a situation of diminishing returns within that. The first person that the society would lock up, thank you, ma'am, um, that would have an impact on crime. The millionth person would have a very small impact on crime. So as you spiral out into the 1 million, 2 million, 2.2 million, you're having less of an effect. And uh, Professor, the vast majority of crime is committed by people who are 15 to 19 years old, right? By 25, the amount of crime people commit plummets. So most people are, are aging out of crime, a out of being a uh, danger to society, while sitting in a cell for decades. So there's the age crime curve, and even I remember from reading about Obama's visit to the facility a few weeks ago, he said something like, there but for the grace of God go I, as if he could have been in that place. Um, and in a way, that might be true if you think about all of the people who've been criming while white or criming while you know in a suburban environment or doing all these other things where they're not under constant surveillance. It's a very different trajectory that they're traveling. Um, and I, that's one part of the book in terms of remedies that I wanted to hear Jeff maybe talk about a little bit more and push back on a bit about this idea of electronic monitoring and saving you know, all of this money. But what does it mean to be under constant surveillance? We know that that's true informally, you know, even right. with the pullback of stop and frisk or what's happening in our neighborhoods with the NYPD patrol towers and all of this sort of panopticon, this all-seeing eye of surveillance and social control. So what does it mean that those who are most at risk of becoming ensnared in the criminal justice system are always under surveillance? And how do we see that as a real remedy where it's formalized and you have to pay for it and you have to do <laughs> all these other things? I, I, I'm really sort of at a loss of thinking about that as a true, true remedy instead of getting at these root problems, that this is how people get into the system this surveillance and monitoring. Can, can I add something about the age that you mentioned? Please. So the science for a long time has shown that the progression of the development of the human brain, that the human brain doesn't fully develop until the mid to late 20s. Mm -hmm. And the part of the brain that develops last is the frontal lobe right here. And anybody who has a teenager or survived a teenager, you understand <laughs> this. Why they do the things they do is their brains can't do any better. So. That, that part of the brain that develops last is the part that controls impulse. And most crime that is committed is committed out of impulse. As a criminal defense lawyer, I represented thousands and thousands of people. Most of my clients did not sit and plot out what they were going to do. Someone else had a stupid idea, they jumped on it out of impulse, and boom, here came the police. That's what drives most of the crime that you find, and most of it is committed during that same age period where the, the brain is not fully developed. And that's why you have a raise the age campaign here in New York State, because we automatically are prosecuting 16 and 17 year olds whose brains are not fully developed and it's as adults. I saw a great note the other day, I'm coming to you, Melissa, um, um, uh, the, the man said, uh, don't speak or write to be understood speak or write to not be misunderstood, which is a higher standard. And if anybody is writing a note card for me, please try to write it as clearly as humanly possible. Because <laughs> this I can read. This is my next question. Some of these, the handwriting is great, but I just cannot read it. I'm sorry. So well, maybe you read, you speak cursive. I'm like, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, Melissa, this person writes, how does NIMBYism impact the promise of community reliance for incarcerated persons. Um, please speak to that if you can. She's like, Just, what are we talking about? Yeah, no, no, repeat the question. Do, how does NIMBYism right. Not in my right, backyard, backyard right. ism. impact the promise of community reliance for incarcerated persons? 
I mean. So, I mean, I guess this is what Jeff is talking about, that quite often people are being sent out of their neighborhoods, which which makes it impossible for them to maintain the, the community social connections. bonds. Yes, and that's, that's actually, you know, yes, that's part of it. And I think that we are starting to see, and we have seen that, as you were referencing, that at the state level, that idea of trying to keep people in their neighborhoods, right? There's the idea of incarcerating less, keeping the community ties as a way of, of really having um, the person be able to, to progress, right? And, and uh, th that's, that's important, that's we're seeing that. I think we need to see that more at the local level. There are some pilot programs that I think the NYPD is implementing in certain precincts about trying, especially with young people, of not putting them in prison, right, or not, or not jailing them, and having do them to some sort of alternative to incarceration programs, keeping them in the neighborhoods and connected to their communities, and that definitely has proven to be very, those programs are much, much more effective, mm -hmm. and we need to see them um, grow. So that idea of maybe the out of sight, out of mind, right, taking somebody that's is gonna be jailed and throwing them upstate or away, you know, so that you can't, you, you don't interact with them, is, is something that is proving to be ineffective. And so I think we want to see, and we've been very supportive at the council level of these alternatives to incarceration, we want to see that grow, and we want to see to implement it more citywide. Right now it's too small, very much done like in a pilot phases. It should be an overall policy that we implement in the city of New York, again, as a way of trying to minimize people's interaction um, with the prison system, and, and that will, um, I think, go a long way. So we're, we're focused on that, and we've supported it. Um, we're seeing some of it being implemented uh, in different neighborhoods, but we want to see it more holistically done throughout the city of New York. I'm getting some good questions from the folks who are watching via the live stream, so thanks for that. Keep those coming. Um, Jeff, are there moves, this is from a live streamer, are there moves to get money out of the prison system, i.e. banning for-profit prisons? It is bizarre to me that even in a capitalistic system which would uh, would commodify anything that we would allow uh, the outsourcing of that i mean if anything government should be in charge of it should be that you would think you would and there are definitely i think moves to uh to get you know to get privatization out especially in the ways like that i highlighted like they're moving to video visits in a lot of states and and counties so the video visits are being sold as a way to increase safety because reduction of visits reduces the opportunity for contraband. So, so if it's a video visit situation, then you would never have, you could never have anybody come? You would never, like what they're doing is they're selling it as like, here's a way to be in touch with people who are far away. What they're not saying is it's a huge profit center, you know, for mm -hmm. the companies that are doing the video visits. And then once the video visits are implemented, most of the places that have done it are slowly withdrawing the opportunity for actual in-person visits mm. and saying, you know, so, so it's real problematic. Um, and yes, there are moves to reduce some of this stuff. I'm, I've been thinking a lot about money and incentives from a lot of different ways. And, uh, and I've actually, like, I don't, I don't think, as I write about, you know, capitalism is alive and well inside of prisons, right? You see the economy and the way it works. But maybe there's a way to shift the incentives. I'm just kind of talking, you know, off the top of my head here. But maybe there's a way to shift the incentives for wardens and for correctional officers to perhaps increase, you know, give bonuses if, if prisoners who leave certain institutions don't recidivate. Uh, or promise that more prisoners will be steered to these institutions, and if there are prison closings, certain prisons won't be closed if recidivism rates from, from prisoners who have been there are 10 or 15 or 20 percent below statewide rates. You know, maybe there's ways to turn these perverse incentives that are harming and contributing to the dehumanization of prisoners around, and uh, I, I don't know, though. Um, another thing you can do to make sure your questions get read is sign them, like this person who is a doctoral candidate at the Harvard Grad School of Ed, so I must ask her question. Um, and this is specifically for Professor Shedd. What could be done to prevent black girls from being pushed out of schools due to an increase in overcriminalization of youth behavior? Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have these schools, right, where they walk in past a police officer through a metal detector. So it's like planning to get ready for prison. 
Yes, you have, you know, what I describe in my book as a carceral apparatus in places that should have a mission of education and nurturing. Um, and your specific interest in black girls, again, we're talking about the margins of the margins with um, girls not being recognized for all that they're vulnerable for. So the young people that I interviewed, there were girls who said, you know, the boys asked me to walk with them on the way home because the police are less likely to stop them. However, the police police are more likely to stop and search me if I'm walking with a boy. So the kind of protective effect it increases their vulnerability. And so how do we think about, you know, this works in terms of how we read girls as vic um, not being victims of anything, thinking about the sort of traumas that they are also facing, but they don't get the attention. They don't sort of get that mainstream attention. And I think for Black Lives Matter, this is coming out with the Say Her Name you know, movement that is alongside this idea of who are the black lives that matter? Why is the narrative always very straight male based? How might we think about the sort of range of people who are impacted by racism, by inequality, by these institutions that are not doing what they should be doing and fulfilling their sort of public mission? You remind me of something that I heard on that famous uh, This American Life about Harper High in Chicago. Which I Right, where they uh, rule, there was three rules. Rule number two, never walk alone because then you're more vulnerable. Rule number three, never walk with anybody else because that makes you more vulnerable. Yes. And they think you're with them, so they want to attack you and them. So how do you follow both of those rules? That's impossible. These are 14 year olds who are thinking about this. And so I will say as a privilege of, you know, a black woman who studied these communities, I'm originally from Mississippi, um, went to graduate school in Chicago, I could navigate neighborhoods that my male cousins never could by myself much more safely because I'm not viewed as a threat, right. a threat to anyone. And so I think it's true when, um, you know, these girls in Harper, they're saying we probably have it the best, but they still got patted down. They still had to go through the same types of things um, that the boys had to deal with, but without even, you know, validation of this being traumatic for them too. Ma Melissa, somebody writes, what will it take to abolish not minimize, but abolish the use of solitary confinement entirely. Are you in favor of getting rid of solitary entirely? Well, there's, as I've mentioned, there's, you know, it's, it's a very complicated question. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not one to, to be as immersed in these things, but there has been the Board of Corrections, which guides the Department of Corrections um, and whatever policies are voted in the Board of Corrections are the ones that have to be implemented in the Department of Corrections. Um, they have seriously reduced the use of uh, solitary confinement and, and applicable in extreme cases, so to speak, right? Um, uh, so we have to monitor, because that's a recent decision. You know, we have to monitor the implementation of that and whether or not it's happening effectively and getting the data to then analyze um, how we proceed. So. I don't know if I could safely say right now or, or, or you know, say that I would consider abolishing it completely, um, but I think that we are in the process, because we do have representatives, the city council does have several representatives on the Board of Corrections, and we just recently appointed for the first time uh, someone to the board who was formerly incarcerated, which is crazy that right. we don't have, we haven't had people, right, on yeah. the board that have, been formally it, it, incarcerated does it, it in it terms is, of guiding the policy because it seems like why should they get to speak why should right we well that's to that? the and that's the mentality that's the problem that we have when we when we discard you know any human being right. or any life that's the problem right so we want to deny conjugal visits we want to make visitation extremely hard we want to you know deny people a vote we want to deny um, people incarcerated an opportunity to educate themselves uh, we want to basically discriminate once they come out because you don't want to get them employed and then you wonder why that person can't succeed, right? Um, and so we, we really have to completely um, re, re, you know, challenge ourselves as a society uh, the way we think and approach the issue of those that are incarcerated. And I just, you know, the issue of, of, of schools and I think one of the challenges, and we've, we've been engaged in that conversation too, is I think there have been always very serious concerns once the school safety agents here in the New York public school system um, 
have been, you know, were, uh, are now part of the NYPD, right? And that's been, I don't know how many years now at this point. Uh, but, you know, ha applying the same mentality, right, of the, of the NYPD and the way you police communities and our streets within a school setting is obviously there's a disconnect. And that's definitely something that is a problem as well. Um, and we're very concerned about that. And, and we're trying to engage. And we've, we have did a lot, we passed a law a couple of years ago called the School Safety Act. And we're making amendments to it as well. Again, it's trying to hold accountability of the, the school safety agents within our school systems. Um, and there's been a lot of resistance to that as well. So there are real attempts to make changes happen. Uh, and I know that the advocacy world and the community has been really forceful in getting us to, to move in that direction. Sophia, um, a lot of Americans don't vote. I think the participation rate is around 50% at our big elections, our big presidential elections beyond that. It drops around a little below 40%. And you know this, the speaker mentioned, as we all know, that they're in most states they're not allowed to vote just because they have a felony. Um, and you know what? I didn't even really think that that was a huge uh, deprivation. I mean, I understand it politically, but I didn't think it would personally hurt people until I read the new Jim Crow. And one of the moments that jumped out at me—I mean, the whole book jumps out at you—but there was a man, I believe. Um, later in the book talking about how he feels dislocated from society and cast out from society because he can't vote. And there's all these sort of deprivations where, you know, having been incarcerated becomes the scarlet letter, that you are cut off from society in all these different ways. So your sentence doesn't end on the day you get out. That, that's true. You wear that scarlet letter right to your grave. And you can't hide from it. And in this world of um, cyber spy, what I call, you, um, you have all these private companies that also can access your criminal record. And they can put it on blast. And then they will actually ask you to pay them to take your name off. <laughs> so we That have sounds like some mafia stuff. Like, mm -hmm. pay us to not wreck your store. That's a good way to describe you know? it, right? Um, so there's a lot of things. But we as a society, though, we can change that. We can say we're not going to support that, we're not going to use that service, and any landlord or any employer that does use it, we're going to boycott your services. We're basically going to out you and tell you that that is not what we're going to accept. That's not the society that we want. But we have to be courageous enough to step up and say we're going to stand up for what's right. Otherwise, we're complicit in part of the problem. Jeff, somebody writes, do you still keep in touch with any of the people you met in prison? And I want to add a secondary question, the, the corollary to that, um, who, who from your time in prison would you least like to see again? Who was the scariest person in the prison? What I'm gonna do while I think about that for a moment is, I, if you don't mind if I do this, um, it's just I wanna acknowledge a couple people and institutions that have helped make this event possible. The first is the Center for New York City Affairs, which many of you come to a lot of center events. I see a lot of familiar faces. The executive, the brand new executive director is Kristen Morse. So if you want to wave to everybody. Um, and then some of you will see in the back a familiar face, Andrew White, who ran the center for a, over a decade. Uh, and so uh, make sure you say hi to him on, on the way out. I also want to acknowledge another co-sponsor of tonight's event, the Humanities Action Lab, which is engaged in a multi-year project around incarceration. And I think uh, Liz Sevsenko, did I pronounce it right? Would you like to stand up and say a few words or? Uh, when the event wraps up, there's a space to continue the conversation uh, with uh, 20 universities uh, and communities in, uh, around the country who are all um, addressing many of the critical questions that are raised here through individual stories like Jeff's and also many that are very unlike Jeff's by uh, uh, grouping into teams um, which in each community are exploring a local history of incarceration from Angola and New Orleans to Rikers here in New York um, to issues of school to prison pipeline in Southern California and um, gathering 
generations of histories and memories and experiences of uh, incarceration in those contexts into a nationally traveling public project that will open here uh, at the new school in April 2016 and then travel to each of the communities that created it. So um, it's a conversation that, um, as the speaker said, is uh, difficult to have and needs to be constant. Uh, and we hope that after you leave this room, you'll participate in that um, by contributing your media, your stories, your reflections, and your opinions to this uh, ongoing dialogue. So for anybody who's interested in more information, there's a, um, uh, some uh, sign-in sheet at the welcome table. So. Thanks for, for this, and I hope this conversation continues with your questions. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much, Liz. So, yes, I keep in touch with some people I was locked up with, but not enough. And one of my biggest regrets, actually, over the last couple of years is having lost touch with some of them. I lost the, in, in one of the uh, storms, um, I guess Hurricane Sandy, I lost my uh, my notebook from prison that had everyone's addresses. And I could go back and find you know, them. I could go into the system and, and, and find them, but from some of the guys, I haven't done that, and I regret that. My first, you know, I did what, what most people do on the outside. For the first couple of years, I sent birthday presents, I sent Christmas presents, I mean, I sent money, you know, and I sent books. Um, that were aligned with things that people wanted to do when they got out. But I've lost touch with some. Uh, others I've stayed in touch with. But it's been much easier for me to stay in touch with the ones that have gotten out. Sure. And paradoxically, there's the least need to stay in touch with them. The most need is to stay in touch with the people who, who are still in. And so just like a lot of us out there, you know, I need to do a better job of that. The one person I don't miss and won't be attempting to reconnect with is named Big C. Um, for those of you who read the book, Big C was, uh, took an interest in me from early on and uh, came to every um, football, softball, and basketball game I played in and cheered for me loudly and then consistently tried to pursue me uh, throughout my time until thankfully one of those guys up there um, told him in no uncertain terms that I wasn't interested. Uh, so really, the prison thought that they were messing with me by giving me that job, but I tell you what, when, when you go into prison at 120 pounds, it's, it's not a bad thing to be good buddies with six of the biggest guys on the, on the yard. Uh, you know, you say that, and, and it, it, it makes a certain sense, but there is no sense. You've entered uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland here, right? You've gone through the looking glass, and I had a friend who did 10 years, and he said, you don't want any friends inside because that relationship then becomes dynamic. You can fall out with a friend and then you have a problem. Um, if I'm friends with you, then that could upset you. And now I have a problem with you and all these sort of little things. And it sounds like that was not your philosophy. Well, there is a junior high component to it in that way. You know, in junior high, everything is so important, right? Like the, in a friendship, you know, and, and, it's in prison, sadly, uh, a lot of people have so little, you know, to their lives that these, these very small slights, these perceived slights even, can take on gargantuan proportions and become the roots of violence. So that's absolutely true. But I couldn't have survived without friends uh, for a lot of reasons in there. And so I did not take that attitude. <coughs> and I met some of the best people that I've ever known in my life. Wow. And I definitely got wisdom in there that's shaped, I received wisdom in there from other men that has shaped and continues to shape my life today. So I would disagree with, I, I understand where he's coming from. And a lot of people find the easiest way to do their time is just to look straight ahead and not, you know, just not mess with anybody and hope that nobody messes with you. I think given, you know, my stature, I, I may not have had that luxury. And I am thankful for the, for the people I met, even though um, not everything turned out, you know, I had difficult moments. For folks here who want to have some taste, some authentic taste of what it's like without actually going there, is there any 
movie, fictional or documentary, any television show that has given any moment that made you feel like, okay, they are getting close to what it felt like? I thought Shawshank Redemption was uh, a, an excellent portrayal, um, and there was a lot of realism in there. Um, I, I didn't feel that way about Orange is the New Black because a woman's prison is so different, I think, from a men's prison, and the, the interracial cooperation, like I watched the first season, and it's like race wasn't even like a thing, you know? It was like black girls, white girls are all hanging out, and I was like, I mean, I went to dinner the, my first night. I'm sitting with the guys in my cell block who were black. And like the first thing my celly said to me, he looked up and he's like, Can't sit there. how many other white boys you see eating with the kinfolk? I was like, none. He's like, all right then. Learn something from that. He's like, because if they come and jump you, he's like, We're not, we don't have your back. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, I'm a fan of the show, not disagreeing with your point. I mean, the segregation is a big deal in there, but that is definitely prison light. It definitely looks like, yeah, like I could handle a year in, in Litchfield. That's nothing. But then you think about a show like Oz, um, that was like, whoa, like any day you could die and the sort of violence, um, uh, the ubiquity of violence th that came through in that show. I've never seen that show, but <laughs> maybe I should. No, no, you've, you, you've done enough. <laughs> um, Sophia, interesting question here. Um, is there a voice in this conversation for crime victims? What, you know, and, and we can say in a bigger minded thing that prison is criminogenic and you are making the world less safe for you and your family, the way we treat. But somebody who's like, you know, my mother got shot by somebody and you want to make prison easier for them. What would you say to that? I would say that if we're going to set up a system where we're guaranteeing that people are, are going to need to be hardened in order to survive it, they're gonna keep that hardened shell when mm -hmm. they come home, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna be more likely mm -hmm. to go get your, your father, your cousin, your brother, your sister the next time. Mm -hmm. Or we can try to be more intelligent and look at what is it that caused the person to commit that crime against your mother and provide all the necessary support services, psychological support, whatever it is that is needed for that person so that when they come home, they're not going to recidivate because we already talked about the recidivism rates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Professor? Um, well, restorative justice is you know, kind of increasing in its frequency where people come together with victims and you know, perpetrators and talk about what happened and think about how do you restore not just order, but sort of restore people to a whole self. And I think um, that movement definitely has some promise. Um, and it's, I think it's important for those of us who are perhaps scholars or activists or legislators to really think about the other side. Um, it was true for me this summer, my first cousin in, um, in New Orleans was shot and killed a police officer, black police officer. And I'm like, I'm up here doing research and the police are, you know, often the enemy in a way, but this is my cousin who's an officer. Um, and just thinking about what does it mean to restore you know, my aunt's feeling of losing her child who was very well respected in the black communities that he patrolled and policed. And so the loss, not just to the family, but what it means for the expanding net of people who are impacted. So um, restoration would be nice. Um, and we can think about that in so many different terms, in terms of the individual level, community level, institutional level, how do we restore the promise of what people could be, peoplehood. Um, W.B. Du Bois was almost sent to a juvenile detention center. Mm. Wow. So first black PhD from Harvard, I don't know where the sister is, if she's still here. Think about the unmet potential Jeff talks about in the book. There are so many people in prison who could be something else. So think if Du Bois was sent to juvenile for stealing grapes with some other kids in Baring, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and they, you know, a principal said, no, nope, just send them, send them with me. Don't send them there. Um, so in a contemporary term, we have to think about how do we restore 
not just personhood, but really help people fulfill the potential. Jeff, are there other nations that are doing this smarter and better? There are. Um, in Western Europe, and in particular in Scandinavia, they're doing it much smarter and much better. And they're using it in the same way that, you know, like you have your kid, you know what it's like to have a little kid. And you say, you know what, it's time for a break. Uh, they treat prison more like that. It's more um, truly rehabilitative than punitive. And, uh, and consequently, their recidivism rates are far lower because their employment rates for people who have been incarcerated are much higher because people have a chance to actually acquire a meaningful skill or trade while they're away. So um, that's the, the scan uh, Norway in particular does a fantastic job. Um, I have, uh, Sophie, I have several cards that speak to the issue of the role of race and racism in fueling the incarceration boom. And we could just say, well, just read the new Jim Crow and you'll see, you'll peep the whole game. But um, for folks who have not yet read that amazing book, um, talk about how race and racism are part of this. Well, race and racism are totally um, intertwined in every single step of the criminal injustice system. Um, and it's not unique to the criminal injustice system. We live in a racist society. Right. And so everything that exists in the society is a product of that. We can't get around that. And so it plays out in decisions that the police make about who they're going to arrest. Are they going to commit, um, arrest? It plays out in decisions from the district attorney about what level of charge they're going to put. It plays out in attitudes from from um, defense lawyers as to how they view their client and the veracity of what their client is saying and what, what they feel is okay for you to plead guilty to. It plays out in judges' decisions. It plays out in intersections with probation officers who make recommendations to judges about sentencing. It plays out once you're a decision made as to what your security cl um, classification should be and how you're treated once you get into the facility. And then let's look at what we have. I'll just use New York again as an example. Clinton Prison is not too far from Canada. Everybody knows where Clinton is now because of the two escapes, right? If you right. never heard of it before, now you know where it is, okay? Clinton facility is about 75 to 80% black and Latino as far as the prison population. There is not one single black guard at Clinton. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, not one, okay? Now, how do you think that's gonna play out? Mm -hmm. In, in a society that we've already agreed, I don't think anybody here is gonna say we're not living in a racist society. We've given up on that post-racial thing, I hope. Okay? Uh, so, I mean, well, I hope so. Okay. So that's gonna play out. It plays out in every step that you go. I've had prison guards who are white in rural facilities say to me, you know, I've never seen a black person who wasn't wearing a, a forest green uniform. Wow. Never seen. In fact, I had one say, oh, ma'am, you know, you're the first one I've seen. I said, well, I don't plan to put on a forest green uniform for you. Okay. Hell no. But, but, that, right. but that's the reality. So if, if your only interaction is with black and brown people who you've already dehumanized and don't recognize their dignity, and then you're fed television shows that that hype that up even more, the likelihood that the racism is going to be exacerbated inside is like 200%. There's, I mean, you talk about how we are, <clears throat> black and brown people are over-policed, over-arrested, over-charged, over-sentenced, over-prosecuted, I forgot, within the over-charged, over, -charged, over uh, Melissa, Melissa Alexander tells this amazing little story in the book that uh, somebody was arrested a uh, white man's arrested with a pocket full of meth and a rifle, and the other person in the office says, well, it's not like he's a gun-toting drug dealer. The guy's like, no, he is literally a gun-toting drug dealer, but because he's not black, he doesn't fit that stereotype of what those words mean. Um, Jeff, you know, final words on what you want to see America do going forward um, with our massive prison problem? 
I actually think Sophia probably said it better than, than I did up front, which is that until we all treat, you know, learn to view people who are incarcerated as humans like the rest of us, any other change proposed is probably not going to happen. And so that's a predicate for every other policy change we'd like to see made. Once we do that, then, you know, we redouble our efforts on the front end on sentencing reform and eliminate mandatory minimums and eliminate three strikes and get better public, you know, don't overload public defenders with 300 cases each. I, I had friends in prison, one of my closest friends said that at his critical hearing, his public defender didn't even know his name, mm. let alone the facts of the case. Mm. He pled to 17 years as a 19 year old for a first time drug offense. Mm. Wow. Then once we've dealt with sentencing reform, then we think about what we're doing on the inside. We know two things reduce recidivism. One, one of them is educational advancement inside prison. A second one is, is nurturing of connections with loved ones on the outside. And we figure out ways to facilitate both of those things instead of what we're doing right now, which is to make them harder. And then third, we look on the back end and try to facilitate successful reentry by all the obstacles that we laid out today, criminal background checks, background checks to, for ha trouble getting housing, having to pay you know, for drug testing in your halfway house when you already owe court fees and fines and you're saddled with debt and you're trying to get back on your feet and pay your child support and see your kids again. There are so many obstacles and we need to make more uh, sustained efforts, not just in the first three months when people are out, but for the first three years. Indeed. Let's thank this amazing panel, Professor Shedd, Speaker Viverito, Attorney uh, Elijah, and Jeff Smith. Thank you all for being here.